from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 271, recorded live Thursday, June 16th, 2011. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott talks with open source developer Frederick Holmstrom about IronJS. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And today we're talking actually to Frederick Holmström, who is actually in uh, Gothenburg, Sweden. He works on IronJS. It's an open source project and it's an implementation of uh, JavaScript, but it's written in .NET. Uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, chat with me. Thanks. So, so you ha- this is a complete implementation of JavaScript, is that correct? Yeah, that's uh, correct. Uh, it- uh, as, as close as possible, it follows the ECMAScript specification to the letter. It's, it's a full implementation, yeah. So, so I could use the, would I use this to power a browser, or would I use this as a scripting language? Why, why does something like this exist? I mean, uh, I built it originally because, uh, well, this is going to be a little story. I, I was building my own, like, you know, the whole NoSQL database uh, train, or the, I, I got on that, so I was working to build my own database. Uh, I needed a sort of like a query language. I began in the completely wrong end of. I started with the querying and the network interface for some reason. So I was playing around with that, and I wanted a query language. Uh, and I was I've been looking at CouchDB and a couple of other, and you know it's the whole JSON JavaScript pretty much everywhere. Uh, so I decided that I'd use JavaScript as a query language. Uh, so I was looking around, and I found the, the JScript engine, which is sort of like, that's available in, I think, .NET 3.5, but I think they cut it in 4.0. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But yeah, it wasn't up to the task, and it's quite slow. So I decided to write my own. Uh, it turns out that writing IronJS was a lot more <laughs> fun than writing uh, the database. database sorry. So uh, I scrapped the database project and started working on IronJS full-time. That's basically my motivation, my original motivation for building it, at least. You say full time. Is this something you do as your job, or is this like your full time hobby? Uh, full time hobby. Yeah. No, <laughs> I wish I could do it <laughs> as a job, but sadly not. Was Was there already an iron something? I mean, is there? Do you have to ask somebody to become an iron something? Because there's iron Python and there's iron Ruby, or is it just that you were the first that decided that you would be built on the on the DLR, so that name made sense? Uh, well, I think uh, there is there was there was one other version using the DLR. A uh, while back, there's a couple of other also available in .NET, but they're not using the DLR. But I mean, the name IronJS for me seemed obvious, so I was looking around on the internet. See, I mean, it was free, so I decided to take it. And one complained. So, what kind of things would someone use this for? I mean, what would the what would the listener say? Oh, great! There's a JavaScript for .NET. I can use it to do this. Like, for example, like my original uh, motivation for building it was that I needed a query language for an application. Uh, I mean, you can basically, I mean, anything you'd need to script or like have your users be able to script your application or stuff like that, you could use this and hook it into your, uh, whatever you have running, like uh, WinForms or WPF app or something. Or like a game or uh, if you want to, I mean, everyone knows about Node.js today and like the whole, like if you would want to build something like that, you could do that also. So, I mean, I mean, you could apply it basically anywhere you'd want a uh, programming language that you can control the environment of. So you bring up an interesting question there, the idea of, of Node.js. Do, do you think that that Microsoft and the Microsoft kind of open source ecosystem needs an implementation of Node or or maybe not Node, but some kind of JavaScript on the server? Uh, I have to say no, because... Uh, like I personally, I like I, I like JavaScript as a language, and I mean it's it's an okay language. But I'm personally not convinced of the uh, of how valid it is having it run on the server. Uh, just because, and I mean the Microsoft ecosystem is so, I mean it's it's huge. I mean you have C sharp, F sharp, and like everything there, and they pretty much cover everything you could possibly do with JavaScript. I mean, yes, I mean the language isn't the same, and it looks a bit different. But like in general, like everything you could possibly hope to do already exists in one way or the other 
to the .NET framework or Microsoft uh, ecosystem. So I personally, I'm not convinced that uh, building like Node.js.net on IronJS, for example, is the right way to go about it. I'd rather see something like a C-sharp version or a F-sharp version using the async workflows from F-sharp or something like that for building asynchronous uh, services and stuff instead of focusing on the JavaScript part of it. See, that's really interesting because I assume that as someone who is writing a compiler effectively, you know, you're in a parser and a lecture and all of this stuff, you're doing a lot of work where you now probably understand the JavaScript language a lot more than most people. I think it'd be fair to say, right? If you implement a language, it tends to get you deep into the language. So I yeah. find it interesting that someone who knows the language so well says that, you know, we really don't need that language on the server side. I think that's kind of interesting. I mean, like, of course I would like, I mean, oh yeah, I would love someone to build uh, this with RNJS or that with RNJS. But I mean, I, I, you also have to be like realistic and, I mean, like, I personally, I'm not believe, uh, I'm not uh, sorry, convinced that that's a good way to go. Because, for example, like F Sharp, and oh, my favorite language, if you take F Sharp, it's, uh, I mean, it's so much more uh, well suited to doing what Node.js does than what Node.js is or JavaScript as a language is. Uh, I mean, like how clean the code gets and everything. Like, I, I don't, oh, I, I, I mean, I like the idea of Node.js, but I don't like the language itself. Uh, in that context, because uh, it becomes awkward and you have to do the, the manual, uh, what's it called, the CPS, uh, continu continued passing, uh, continuation passing, sorry, uh, manually, basically. And it's, it's uh, I'm not convinced. Interesting. So so what kind of things is JavaScript suited for? I mean, do you think it's just a, a, an interesting language for DOM manipulation? And that's about it? I mean, in the browser, obviously, it has has its place in the browser. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, if it would be possible to... Really, I mean, you have, like, CoffeeScript and stuff like that that's compiling down to JavaScript nowadays, and there's another couple of small languages that does the same thing. But JavaScript as a language, I think... I don't know, like, honestly, it, and this is kind of an awkward comment from someone who's built a JavaScript runtime, but, I mean, I'm not convinced that how of the language. Like, it's... Personally, it's... I mean, it's a... I mean, it's hard to express. Uh, like, it's. Uh, I mean, it has a broad, uh, like, what do you want to call it in English? Uh, like, like it's available everywhere. Like on all the browsers, all the platforms are everywhere. But the language itself does not hold any major merit, in my point of view. Especially after building an, uh, an implementation of it, you you know all the idiosyncrasies and all the weird and excuse me, stupid stuff in it. Hmm. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's very interesting because I think that, um, the, the ubiquity, right, the fact that it's available everywhere is, is certainly its, its strength, but it's one of those things where it's available everywhere, but it's also insane, but we tolerate it. And l yeah, lately I, I've been seeing a lot of talks, a lot of presentations with people saying, yeah, JavaScript is great, JavaScript is fun, and here's the totally weird stuff where, you know, null is equal to false or, you know, whatever kind of weird stuff that people are, um, coming, you know, whatever weird language design things that, that happened organically that people bring up. And then they kind of laugh about it. But again, then they say, well, but it's available everywhere. So these are funny. You know, it's kind of like that crazy uncle. You know, JavaScript is that yeah. crazy uncle that we yeah. all have, but we have, you know, he's our uncle. What are we going to do? He's always there. Yeah. I mean, uh, like I said, like, and then you have like the whole like I'm not gonna start bashing JavaScript too much, but a major part for me, a major part of the problem for me, I mean, you have all the idiosyncrasies and all the really weird stuff, like you, like the no is true and stuff like that. And but uh, big part for me is that there is no way to organize your code in JavaScript. There's no built in the language. There's no module system. There's no namespacing. No nothing. It's just a global free for all, basically. And that's a, yeah, which is the major problem for me, at least, coming from like C sharp, F sharp, or even Python or Ruby. There's some kind of organizational scheme in place there. In JavaScript, there's just like you have the global object, which people can do whatever they want to. That's not a model. That's at least for me, it's it's not something that could uh, like if you're gonna build something huge and complex, that's it's not good enough. What um, what do you think about? the other languages, the other Iron languages, not about the languages themselves, Iron Ruby and Iron Python, 
But the, yep. the the fact that they exist and what the community support around them is. I mean, I think it's great. And, I mean, personally, like, the way I learned, I mean, if you're just looking from my point of view, the way I learned the DLR was basically reading the Iron Python source code, uh, top to bottom, pretty much. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I think it's great. And also you have JRuby, and I think it's called Python, the one that runs on the JVM, yeah, for Python. Uh, I mean, and they push... Uh, I mean, they push the boundaries of those languages uh, in terms of, like, for example, you can get threading in uh, JRuby and uh, Iron Ruby and uh, etc. So I think I think it's good for the language and the community as a whole to have those other implementations available, even though they might not be uh, like become the canonical one, or mm-hmm. I doubt they doubt they ever will. But it's uh... so you're saying that the, just because the fact that they're not perfect uh, implementations, that the fact that they exist still is important. For example, like, I mean, how many, I read a thread on Reddit a couple of days back. It was like, there exists, like, I don't know how many C++ compilers. People are saying, like, why don't we just have one of them? Or one of this, like, one that's the best. But the problem is, like, that's not really something you can apply. And what's best is different for different type of people. Like, if you're going to use Python or Ruby and you actually need threading, like, you have to have it, then you can run Iron Python or Jython and you'll actually have a real threading, threading instead of the sort of half-baked green threads or whatever it's called It's called on uh, Ruby and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's... Uh, I think it's good for the language as a whole, yeah. Have you have you worked with the other Iron uh, folk, the other Iron people, the other Iron folks, and talked about the DLR or found any issues in the DLR itself? The DLR, of course, being the, the dynamic language runtime. Uh, yeah, uh... I mean, especially the uh, through the DLR forums uh, on dlr.codeplex.com, uh, I got into contact with a couple of people who uh, who built the DLR. Uh, Bill Childs, for example, helped a lot, uh, especially in the early stages of building IronJS back in, say, this is January 2010, so about a year and a half ago. Uh, there's pretty much no documentation available for the DLR uh, except for a uh, demo, like demo language and a... Uh, uh, and a, like a technical specification, or like what do you, what do you want to call it? And uh, and then when you're actually starting to build something, there's a million questions, uh, and those guys really helped me out. Uh, yeah, they know who, who they are. What is the difference between the? Is there like a DLR that's inside of uh, .NET that ships with .NET, and then there's ongoing work, or did you just use the one that came in .NET four? I mean, uh, IronJS uses the ones uh, uses the one that mm, came in .NET 4. But if you want to run IronJS on .NET 3.5 or 3.0 or 2.0, you have to use the one that's available from uh, CodePlex and compile it separately. IronJS ships with all the DLLs and everything. So, but uh, the main, I mean, the main, uh, the main branch is uh, targeted for 4.0, and that's where we do all the bulk of our development, and then we backport whatever we need to make it run on uh, 2.0 uh, to 3.5. Also, but that requires the uh, the extra deal, uh, DLLs you get from CodePlex, basically. And does that so that means that you have a newer version of the DLR if I want to implement IronJS in my application? Well, if you're using 4.0, it's going to be the DLR that shipped with 4.0. Uh, I see. But if you're using 3.5, 3.0, or 2.0, it's going to be the uh, DLLs that oh, well, are available uh, I see. whenever okay. we grab them the last time, basically. Okay, so then I guess my kind of my question, which is probably more subtle than I wanted it to be, was there's nothing blocking in the DLR implementation that shipped with 4.0. There's nothing, there's no bug that's so awful that you couldn't do. Oh, no, absolutely not. Uh, I mean, it's built, it's targeted at the DLR in 4.0, and that's what we're working at. Uh, then, there, I mean, there has been, a, I think there was one issue where there was a feature that had changed or something that we had to patch and fix. But... Um, uh, in general, it's I'm working flawlessly. Very cool, very cool. That's comforting. <laughs> How much? Uh, whenever I hear about someone writing a language implementation, I always get back to like when we did this in in computer science. Did, did you did you go to university and, and implement parsers and lexers and things? No, I'm one of those uh, like what do you call it? like uh, like I I barely finished high school pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> And then I've been programming since I was like 10, 11 or something. And I don't know, around I don't know, five, six, 
seven years ago. I, I started reading about you know, implementing languages, and then I, all, I mean, I learned it as I went along, building a little DSL here, building a little parser there, you know, like for small stuff, and then it all culminated in uh, RNJS. Basically. Okay, I think I think that the word for that is unnatural. <laughs> I think if you're writing uh, yeah, your uh, own language implementation and you haven't gone to, uh, to university, you're a natural. What? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what uh what did you what did you have to do as far as like computer science research? I guess I want to understand that I always thought of it as being an extremely complicated thing. You know, I remember when I was doing this in in college, it always seemed like the most impressive thing, you know. People dragging buttons around and making UIs was was interesting, but you know, it was always the either the guy working on the kernel you know, doing yep. something low level like a driver, or it's the person who's implementing their own language that really always blew me, blew my mind. Did you have to do any research on the correct structure, the kind of the classic science behind, you know, building an abstract syntax tree, or did you just look to the existing implementations for your help? I mean, I I don't know how many books I read uh, in total. I think it's about six or seven books, like you know, like thick, like homes basically on everything from like lexing parsing uh, like compiler implementation stuff like that uh, I think yeah I think I read about seven books in total um, and it's funny that you say that in uh, like in a uh, university or college like because I was a complete opposite like uh, whenever uh, whenever whenever anyone wanted us to sort of like you know build a GUI or build this or that it's like it's boring I preferred the like the low level stuff that it's like just the black and white like there's no UI no nothing it's just like a console output, and that's it. And that's <laughs> so. That's just that's that's what you just dig. That's you're built in that way. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's that's what I prefer to work with. Like no graphics or anything, just like a console UI, like building libraries and uh, languages and stuff like that. This episode of Hansel Minutes is brought to you by Careers 2.0. Careers 2.0 is a new service by our friends at Stack Overflow. You're probably all familiar with Stack Overflow, the online Q&A resource dedicated specifically to programmers and programming-related topics. Well, the team at Stack Overflow created Careers 2.0 to provide you with access to great jobs and introduce you to a bunch of great companies that you might consider working for, even if you're not currently looking for a job. Think of Careers 2.0 as a programmer profile. It gives you a platform to show that you're awesome by featuring your proudest contributions to Stack Overflow, GitHub, SourceForge, Bitbucket, anything programming related. You can even add your favorite programming books from Amazon.com. Profiles on Careers 2.0 are free. They're easy to get started, especially by importing your LinkedIn profile. However, there's one catch. Profiles on Career 2.0 are invite only. They did this to keep out the spam and have a high-quality environment. Fortunately for you, as a Hansel Minutes listener, I've got your back. Head on over to Careers dot stackoverflow.com slash hm to accept your invitation today. Once again, that's careers dot stackoverflow dot com slash hm. I hope you like it. The um, can you walk us a little bit through the structure, like what's actually involved in this? You you know you have a text file with like foo dot js. Do you have to do the parsing? Uh, what is available to you as a, as, as a language service? You know, what do you do and what do they do, I guess, is my question. If you start I mean, from, what like, the DLR does and what I, I do. Basically. Yeah, all the way from the point where someone opens this file up and starts looking at the, you know, the bite by bite. Where, how does that process work? I mean, basically, the first thing I do is uh, I, you read the file in uh, into RNJs. So RNJs reads the file into its compiler. Uh, there's a little excerpt that basically splits the file up into tokens. Uh, becomes uh, It's called a stream of tokens or stream of lexemes. Uh, basically, just uh, keywords and numbers, and you know, like the building blocks. Basically, there's no pattern or syntax yet. It's just like the building blocks lined up. Did you have to write the the parser? Yeah, that, that's that's uh, handwritten in F sharp. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pretty much everything RNJs does is handwritten in F sharp. There's no like auto auto generated stuff. So I want to make sure that people understood this because I just my mind was just blown. Most of yeah, RNJs. Yeah, so- is actually written in F sharp, not C sharp, correct? Yeah, pretty much. Well, there's uh, only, I mean, the unit tests and stuff are written in C sharp, but uh, everything is written in F sharp, yes. Wow. 
that's cool. And you think F sharp is, I know I'm going a little bit of a tangent, but F sharp is well suited for doing this kind of work, for language work? Uh, I mean, that's the reason I picked F sharp. Uh, first of all, I wanted to learn the language also. I was in, I mean, I've dabbled in F sharp before I started RNJS, but uh, I hadn't actually built anything major in it. Uh, but, uh, I mean, functional programming and what I've learned, I learned over the year and a half or two years I've been working on this, is like F sharp is made for these types of problems. It's, uh, uh, it's, just, it's perfect. I'm the only word I have, actually. So building trees, parsing stuff, doing it in a kind of a mathematically provable and very tight way. This is what F sharp is yeah. meant to be done. Yeah, and especially like the amount of like how few lines of code you end up with. Like all of RNJS is about nine and a half thousand lines of code, which is not a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean there is, it's of course very very dense in tiers, but uh, compared to I, I had one version in C sharp that's I think it was around thirty thousand lines, which wasn't even complete. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I love the language. It's uh, awesome. Wow, that seems nine nine and a half thousand lines for the whole thing. Yeah. And did it start out that small and stay small, or did, is it one of those things where it started out big and you started yanking stuff out and you you, you refactored? No, it's been uh, it's been growing basically uh, as we add more features. I mean, uh, for a while we were hovering around like six thousand lines for a couple of months, uh, but then. Um, we added all like the native like uh, built-in uh, Glo- JavaScript objects and stuff, and those take up a lot of uh, like line space because there's a lot of weird stuff. <laughs> well, if you know JavaScript, you know what I mean. There's a lot of weird methods and weird stuff you need to account for in the built-in functions and uh, objects. So those took about two and a half, three thousand lines. So. Slick, slick. Okay, so then this becomes uh, you parse it into tokens, and then the, t- the token turns into a, an abstract syntax tree. Is that tree structure provided by the DLR, or is that something you have to build? Uh, well? No, that's a uh, tree structure that's built in F-sharp. Um, you could potentially, you could go directly to uh, the DLR, like expression tree, uh, but uh, there's, I want to do a lot of optimizations and stuff uh, that can't be done on the expression trees. So I first build a uh, like uh, RNJS's own uh, syntax tree, uh, well, abstract syntax tree type, so a tree of that, and then I do a lot of optimizations on that, uh, and then I convert it to a DLR tree, and then I ask the DLR to compile it, and then gives me the whole dynamically compiled delegate back that uh, you can invoke. Okay, so so there's the interesting part there, the 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 handoff. What services did the DLR provide to you once you'd done the hard work of parsing the language and understanding the language? I mean, basically, um, so if I back up a bit, what I will have, like after I've read the file and I parse it into an abstract syntax tree and I'm done with optimizations, I'll have a, a syntax tree that is not DLR specific, it's RNJS specific. Uh, then I run it to what it is called the compiler internally in RNJS, which is what takes the uh, a syntax tree in RJS form and converts it to uh, this expression tree, which is exactly the same ones that you get with link and stuff in C sharp. Uh, and uh, that's basically what the DLR uh, provides for me. So I turn it into these uh, expression objects, which I then then call con- dot compile on the uh, topmost one or the outer one, mm-hmm. which turns it into the IL dynamically uh, in well in a dynamic assembly in .NET 4.0. Gives me like a delegate back or, yeah. One of the things that people had said would always be difficult for the whole iron class of languages was the idea that, uh, the, the, the DLR is ultimately still on top of the CLR and the CLR likes things compiled. And even though there's yep. things like, uh, you know, method site caching and all sorts of optimizations to make things fast, ultimately, it's just not structured appropriately for a language that's so dynamic as as JavaScript. Is is that what is keeping you from being as fast as you know, like a C sharp, or as fast as you know, Google Chrome, or something like that? Is it just that the CLR won't let you go that fast, or is it something else? I mean, uh, we're about I'd say we're about uh, ten times slower than Google Chrome currently. Uh, they're about like ten, twelve, thirteen times slower. And, like, there's going to be a point where we can't get any faster because, like, the CLR, because, I mean, 
Like if you have hand hand optimized C or C plus plus code, will always be faster than the equivalent C sharp code because of the CLR, for example. Mm-hmm. And there will be a point when we hit that wall. Uh, I think I'm I'm expecting it to be around three or four times slower than Chrome. Sort of what I'm aiming at. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, right now, it's uh, like we just haven't had time to do enough optimizations uh, to make it that fast. Like all the optimization tricks that uh, Google Chrome uses are not in place in IronJS, so we lose a lot of uh, performance that way. Um, we're never going to be as fast. It's uh, I'd say physically impossible since the CLR does more work per instruction than uh, the native code does. Mm-hmm. I noticed that last uh, last month you became faster than IE8, though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty mind-blowing. I mean, that must have been... Ins- I mean, were, were you, did you know you were close to getting that fast, or did you just test it one day and say, oh, wow, look at that? Oh, I, I, I knew I was going to beat IE8, and I'm like... Uh, like yeah, I've, I've been like... I've been building prototypes for different types of features and optimizations for... Uh, like as a side project, like my private uh, RNJS repository has about 50 branches with different optimizations, tr- optimization tricks and stuff in it. Uh, and uh, I knew I was going to be faster than IE8 eventually. It was just a matter of time. Uh, so what we did was we finished up the uh, the 0.2 release that basically completes the ECMA 3.0 specification uh, support. And then me and John Gibson, who's helping me on this, they decided to uh, start optimizing stuff. And just basically, I started implementing the uh, tricks that I already discovered or learned from Chrome and already tried out in one of my development branches. Just porting them over, basically. I see. So so IronJS 0.2, which came out recently, was really more of a correctness release and not an optimization release. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's... Uh, Basically, ECMAScript 3.0, uh, 3.0 support, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It looks like you've got 5,500 tests with over 30,000 assertions. And are you passing them all? Uh, let's see here. There's actually about 10,000 tests now. Let's see. I have the wiki oh, somewhere excuse me. <laughs> in front of me. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we have about 11,000 tests. Uh, we're failing about 344 of them currently. Wow, 11,000 um, tests, and you're failing under 400 of them. Yeah, about 350. Uh, 96.8 pass rate, if that matters. Um, and I think it's about 60,000 assertions or something. Wow. So you think that someone could totally use, even at 0.2, they could start looking at using this as a scripting language within their existing application. You would feel comfortable with it. It's, it's correct enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, like, if you're after the feature set... Uh, in terms of like you want a scripting language, if you're not looking so much for speed, zero uh, point two is uh, perfectly suitable for uh, integrating into uh, your uh, platform of choice. Um, I mean, we're we're looking to get better. Uh, like, you could easily call like JavaScript stuff from .NET, and you can also like expose .NET uh, classes and functionality to JavaScript. But we're looking at a better. Way, we're rather implementing right now a better better way to get. Uh, like what we call seamless.NET integration, which allows you to basically pass any .NET object into JavaScript and then call it like it was a native JavaScript object or whatever. See, that was my next question. That seems really interesting. I, I, it, yep. it would be. Do you have any sample applications? It'd be nice to see if someone could kind of bring this down with NuGet, you know, and I could say, you know, file new console application, install package, iron.js, Make a couple of uh, .NET objects, throw them into JavaScript space, and start scripting against them with JavaScript directly within, you know, ten lines of code. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have. Uh, I mean, the problem right now, uh, not much, so much a problem. It's basically we haven't. I haven't had time to build the uh, what I like, like the integration. Uh, it's called the bi- DLR binders for the integration for uh, against CLR objects. Mm-hmm. But once that's in place, it's uh, basically just going to be passed object in and call whatever you want on it, and it'll work flawlessly. Uh, there is a way, like if you need to, like if you need to use a zero point two release and you actually want to pass object an object in and call methods on it, it is possible today. But it's a bit like, annoying. Basically, it's, it requires a bunch of code to do it because you need to 
expose it, uh, expose it as a native JavaScript object instead of a CLR object to JavaScript. So it's, it's a bit annoying. There is an example on how to do it in the wiki on GitHub, but how how large is this project, uh, and, and and do you need uh, do you need help? You know, what would you tell the community? Is it just you and a couple of friends, or is it just you? Who who is involved, and how can people help? Um, basically, I mean, I've done the bulk work. I'd say about ninety percent uh, myself, maybe a bit less. Um, in uh, March or February, uh, February, I think uh, a guy named John Gibson uh, from the states started submitting patches to it, and uh, a couple, after a couple of days. Uh, started working together, and uh, he got access and everything, and we've been running the show together uh, up to the 0 0.2 release, and, well, still are. Um, and it, basically, it's two of us. Uh, like, if the community wants to help, uh, the best way is just to fork the project on GitHub, uh, mm -hmm. make a couple, like, changes, and send a pull request, and then after, like, a couple of, like, good pull requests, we'll just grant you access to the main repo, and you can start hacking away on the master branch. Very cool. And that really is the way that it should be done these days with, uh, with things like Git and things like Mercurial. Just fork it, work on it on your own, do your thing, and then, uh, say, hey, look, I did something interesting. And people will check it out. Yeah. And it's, it's not like we require some, like, major, like, oh, add completely new feature or something. We just, like, a couple of lines of fixes or, like, a couple of bug fixes here or something, and you'll get access and can start pushing to the main repo. So, I mean, that's how John got. Uh, John got a well start on it. He, I think, he generated new unit tests or something, which was exactly what I needed for the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And just like, oh, cool, and we started working together. Mm, that's great. That's great. That's that's how it should work, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, I really like the sort of like, I mean, GitHub and what's called Bitbucket and stuff like that. It's sort of it's it's sort of like the social network, but for geek programmers, basically, like yeah, programmers. Uh, yeah, I, I think GitHub is as important for uh, like programmers as Facebook is for. Um, I, I don't want to say normal people, but people who are not programmers. <laughs> I put it like that. Cool. Well, I appreciate you sharing with us. It looks like there's lots of information about IronJS up on ironjs.wordpress.com and charts and graphs. Also at the yep. GitHub repository, they can look, bring the whole thing down and get it running on their own machines. We'll put all of that together in the show notes, as well as a couple of interesting articles from places like eWeek and InfoQ about IronJS. And uh, folks can probably follow you on Twitter, I assume. Yeah, uh, FJ Holmstrom. Uh, yeah, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, yeah. We'll link to that as well. Thanks for yeah. the time. This is really interesting. I'm glad that people are still going forward with the DLR and Iron this and that, because uh, I think that there there is a need this stuff and I hope Microsoft realizes it one day. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I mean, the DLR is a great piece of software. It's, uh, it's probably, I, I said this before, but it's probably the best library I've ever used in my whole life. That's uh, a testament to how freaking good it is. Very cool. Alright, this has been another episode of Cancel Minutes and we'll see you again next week. <laughs> <laughs>